faux bar. So you can get really minimal in here, really minimal. In fact, I think that's what it looks like when I went into it and I thought, whoa, where is everything? OK, now moving down, you have the work area, the canvas area in the middle. The area that you actually put the pixels on that is your image is the white bit. The brown bit is the canvas area that can hold other elements, but doesn't isn't part of your artwork. Now, that's all right as far as it goes. But if you don't have access to your tools and your layers, you're not really going to get much work done. And that's where the buttons on the very minimal toolbar come in. They go to the top there and click the drop down. Hide layers has a tick next to it. So that's telling us that the layers are actually hidden. I must admit, I thought if I clicked on that, it was a toggle and it would show the layers and it's not. What I need to do to see the layers is to choose thumbnails or list view, one or the other. So if I click on thumbnails, I get a thumbnail that represents my layers on the left hand side. Now, this is a new file, so there's only the one layer in there. And you're probably quite surprised because I think every other application has layers on the right and they're on the left in here. But as they will, they've just decided it's going to be on the left. Now, you can also change the display of the layers to a list. Now, that starts to look a little bit a little bit more like other applications. You can, as you see as well, widen that if you want. So if you've got very long layer names, you can make them much wider. But that's what you can do in there. If you compare this with Pixelmator and Photoshop and Affinity Photo, you'll be thinking there's usually a little menu at the top and some buttons and, and you know, um, opacity sliders and all kinds of things. And it's not there. It's not there. They have gone for incredibly minimal with this, incredibly. But don't panic. It's quite powerful. You can do a lot with it. We'll see that as we work through it. Right, going back up here, you can also up there, get your rulers back, your grid back, your guides back and show the info bar. So that's that first button there. You can also in here with this button, which is a plus button third along, you can start to add extra layers. So I'm going to add a couple of extra layers because without them, it's not going to make sense. So I can click on get uh, another new layer. And now you can see as I hover over it, let's zoom in so we can see that, you can start to work with your layers in terms of locking them or toggling them on and off. So it starts to bring back some of the power. It just isn't completely in your face like every other application, but it is there. It, it, the idea is that it appears when you need it. So hopefully it will. There was also up there as I went in, I just said layer, you know, just add a new layer. But you can also add a specific type of layer. You can add a text layer, which puts some text on a layer for you. And you can see you get a different icon telling you that that is actually a text layer rather than just a standard layer. You can also insert shapes. So we could just put a rectangle in on a shape layer. So there we have a shape on a shape layer. We've got adjustments that you can put in. You can add in effects. You can add in photos. That will open up your photos app and pull them in from there. I'm just contemplating not doing that because um, I've updated this machine and it's doing all kinds of things with my uh, Apple Photos app. And there's FaceTime as well. We could do that. But hey, nobody wants to watch it, me while we're doing this. Believe me, you do not want to watch me while we're doing this. You can also choose. And what that will do is go away and let you choose. So uh, I've got them. Where's my data? My data's in my documents. It's in there. It's not in there. It's in Pixelmator Pro in my data folder. These are all my files. And I've got lots of files in there. So what I'm doing is I'm opening up a new image, but I'm, I'm automatically putting it in a layer. I'm not opening it in its own space. I'm inserting it into my current image. So there it is. It's imported it. It's also done something else, which we're going to come back to, which notice it knew it was a dog. We'll discuss this shortly. So that was that button there, which was the plus button that enabled you to add content to the current file Instead of just adding a layer and then working with it, you do two things at once. You tell it what kind of content you want and it automatically puts it in for you. So that's what you've got up there. Right. But I said before we go any further, I'm going to finish off the interface. Then I'm going to go back and make a template and then we'll go through the features. So we've got our layers list on the left hand side. What we don't have at the moment is any tools whatsoever. Right. That is over on the other side. So the, the, the button on the left, the leftmost button is your layers. The button on the rightmost side toggles your tools on and off. 
So I'm going to make sure that I've got the um, it's, it's the arrange tool. It's the one that you get when you press command and when you press V, actually just V. Now, see what happens as I move over my tools over here, I get a pop out that gives me the names of the tools. So I don't have to remember any shortcuts. I can just hover over them and they all appear and I can choose which one I want. Now, I said that bar at the top, the info bar, the info bar, if you've used Pixelmator, has tool settings on it. They're not there anymore. But if I move away, we can see here that what we're looking at is the tool settings for the tool I actually have selected, which is the arrange tool. And if you look at what's on there, that makes sense. Move to back, bring to front, sizing it, position of it, rotation, locking it, hiding it, grouping it. Those are all things to do with arranging. And that's why they are on there, because I have the arrange tool selected. As I select a different tool, like the select tool, my options change on the right hand side. So that is now where you will look for your tools options over there on the right hand side. And as you go through these, some of them are very similar. So those two are very similar. The um, rectangular marquee tool and the freeform tool, very, very similar. But as you go through, they have different settings depending on what they are. So as I go through, you can see that they're very different. We will see that as we move through it. But that is how to get those on and off. So you can use your full interface to concentrate on an image or you can bring back more tools in there. Right, so now we know how the interface works. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'll just show you how this works with the forward and backward because I think that's actually quite interesting. At the moment, the dog is at the top of the layer stack on the left-hand side. But by using this slider, I can take it back and each notch that I take it back brings an element if you look over on the left hand side and I'm moving the dog up, moving the dog down. And as I do, what's shown on the canvas changes. So rather now you can do it the old style way, which is move across to the layers and just drag and drop it. It's exactly the same thing. You just have this extra option over on the right hand side with your tools. Right. So don't need that image. I'm going to close that image down. He's gone. What I will do is open up a file. Uh, that's already got some content in it. So uh, if I go back to my data, I've got something for new templates. So I'm going to open up the poster for this event and let's go full screen with that. I make a lot of posters for events, so it would be a very good starting point if I didn't have to start completely from scratch. So the poster that I've got here is for this event. It's got in it three elements and a background. It's got an icon, it's got some text and it's got the sidebar on the left hand side. And as I select each of those elements, they get selection handles around them. I've just used a shortcut key, which is command and zero to bring that up so I can have it full size while I'm working and we can all see it better. And as I select, as I say, each of these elements, they get handles around them. It would be a great start for me if I at least had the sidebar. I don't particularly need the icon, don't particularly need the text at the bottom. But just if I had that sidebar would be a good start. So what I'm going to do is prepare this file to become a template. And the easiest way to do that is to select the items that I don't want. So this one over here, right click and delete it. Don't need the text. Select the icon. Don't need that. Delete. That file is now ready to become a template. And to make a template, you go to file, you go down to save as template. And it gives you a message, which is you can add this document to the template chooser or save it to your computer. Well, adding it to the template chooser would mean that you don't have to go and find it when you want it. It would it would be as important to Pixelmator Pro as its built in templates. It would have the same level. It wouldn't necessitate you going to do anything extra to use your personal template. So I'll say add to template chooser. Now I have this new template. It's saying it's 1280 by 720, which is quite right. But for me, this is my poster and I will put there white after it, which means my sidebar is white and press enter. I've now named my template. I'm looking at my template chooser and I have one extra thing, which is over on the left hand side. I have a custom folder for my templates. All of the other templates are there, all the iconographies and the film and video we already used. But I now have my templates. Now, also in here, while we're looking at it, I can choose to show details and the details are the width, height, resolution, color depth. 
So uh, that's the details of it. And if I look at the other ones, I can have those details. And as I go through, it updates and it gives me information about that file. But the important thing is that that is my template. I have made a custom template. And uh, there is my custom template, I think, possibly. Uh, wondering why it hasn't got my content in. That's not good. But um, I've made a custom template. Basically, most of my templates have no content at all. They're just set sizes or things like that. But you can create your own templates in there. So there we go. We have a new template. Right. OK, so we've done the template. We've done the interface. We're going to have, we've looked at the layers in terms of quite basic, to be honest. But one of the new features is automatic layer naming. So what I'm going to do in here is close that file down and start completely from scratch. I don't want you to think that there is any underhandedness going on here. I am just going to choose um, a default size. So there's my, uh, that's not my default. Why is it? My default one was bigger than that. Oh, that's smaller than I expected for my default one, but never mind. We'll use it anyway. So I have a file. There's nothing in it. What I also have is my folder here, my folders. And I have a folder that's got all these images in it. And the reason that I'm showing you this is so you can see the names of the files and they're not exactly um, user friendly. It says baby cat held by a woman, beautiful Siberian husky dog in winter forest. So if we have a look at these images, they are very descriptive of what we're looking at. As you can see, I like animals particularly dogs. Uh, not so keen on cars, but hey, need, needed something different. So as I look through these, I've got lots of different images. I was wondering if it would recognise a dog or a cat or indeed a lion. Would it be able to tell the difference? Because this feature that I'm going to demonstrate with these images is part of the machine learning aspect that Pixelmator themselves have been really pushing which is automatic layer naming. So these are the images I'm working with. And first off, I'll start, isn't he gorgeous? Uh, first off, I'll start with that baby cat. So I'm going to put that there and I'm just going to demonstrate dragging and dropping that in to my image. Now, as I hover over it, you can see the, the layer name should technically be in any other application, baby cat held by woman, blah, blah, blah. But as I let go, it actually puts in cat. It knew and it appeared in yellow. I'll do it again slowly so you can see it. Well, actually, I can't make it do it slowly, but never mind. Right, Siberian Husky. Watch the name on the left when I let go. It comes in kind of yellow and it fills in from the left hand edge and then it fades out to white. And what it's doing is machine learning. It's looking at the image and trying to work out what it is. And it's not doing a bad job so far. Let's see what it what it what will it make of the car. So let's drag that in. Steering wheel. Whoa, that's good. So it does. It works brilliantly. So what we'll do is we will add in the rest, all of them, all at once, and let's see how it does with the rest of them. So it, just imagine you're bringing in elements of your design. And you drag and drop all of those in, and that is what the machine learning is all about. Let's see how accurate it is. Well, it is a cat. It's focused in on the whiskers, though, which I thought was very interesting, but it is the cat. Now, the poor dog. So what I'm going to have to do so you can see these is toggle them off. The poor dog uh, is known as a pet. Not quite accurate. It's a dog. But if I right click on that and think, well, it's not bad. I could leave it a pet, but actually it's a dog. Right click on it, go down to the bottom and you have suggested names at which point it comes up with some alternatives. So it found five that it thought were fairly accurate. For whatever reason, it just decided to go with pet. But luckily, it did know enough to, to think it was potentially a dog. So I can just choose dog from there and it will add it in. As we look through the rest, so I'm toggling these off, it knew that was a cat. It knew this one was a dog, which is the one with the dog with the lead in its mouth. Um, it knew that one was a dog, which I was impressed with. I will openly admit I was impressed with that. Uh, let me go in there and uh, move that. I was impressed that it knew it was a dog because there was two of them and you don't really have much in the way of shape of the dog behind. So I was impressed with that one. It got both of the lions. It knew they were both lions. There's the first lion, there's the second. No, that's the second lion. This one, I actually wasn't, to be honest, quite sure what that was myself. Um, it's not... It's not a cat, 
it's a wildcat of some description. But again, it went for whiskers for that one. So again, if you wanted something more descriptive, you could go in. Now, it's not an owl, but I can see where it's come from, because if you look at the ears, it could well be. Um, I'd probably put cat for that. But if you look at the ears, it does actually have a look of an owl. So the machine learning aspect is, is quite accurate. It is quite accurate. So turn that one off. We've got another cat there. It like that. I was very impressed with the train because there is an engine on that. Um, and it didn't do bad. It did not do bad doing that. And it made pretty, pretty good guess on that. Uh, it did pretty well with car as well. So it got that. The next one, it let me down. It let me down badly on the next one. It thought that was a polar bear. Having said that, anybody who knows me knows that that was what my lad looked like. Um, I had a dog for 13 and a half years. It was a Samoyed. And I can't tell you the number of times when we were out walking him that people said, oh, is it a polar bear? So I'll go with that. It does look like a polar bear, but it's not. It's a dog. So let's have a look and see what it made of the, the alternatives. And it did think it could potentially be a dog. Not too sure about tree. Don't know where that idea came from, but yeah, we can correct that to dog. And then just to quickly go through the rest, measuring instruments, although that was a steering wheel. Let's have a look if it had that as an alternative. It didn't, because if you look at it, it's thinking dials and watches and clocks and things. So a uh, steering wheel wasn't an option at that point, but not bad, not bad. It did know this Samoyed puppy was a dog, so pretty good there. Got another cat there. It was okay with that. Got the steering wheel. Those were the ones we saw before. So when you hear about Pixelmator Pro and you hear about machine learning, this is what it's talking about. Uh, dragging things in and it automatically naming the layers for you. Right. So that was that's what that is. That's what that is talking about. So let me go back and get more data to show you something else. Oh, where are you going? taken me to wrong places here so I can't even oh maybe I can get to it that way let's have a look need my data back there's my data okay let's move that out of the way and go back get more data right another thing that they're pushing quite considerably is the changes between Pixelmator and Pixelmator Pro and one of the things I'm just going to close that we don't need that one anymore so uh, delete to that Let's go in and get this image. So I'm opening up an image off screen, but it will open up hopefully in the right place. And did it? No, it didn't. It put it on the other screen. Let's get that full screen. All right. And this thing is the difference between the crop tool in the old version of Pixelmator and the crop tool in the new version of Pixelmator. In the old one, if you remember, I won't waste time opening it up. I'll just tell you. In the old one, you used to draw around it and then crop to what you drew around. In here, it's actually quite different. Now, the crop tool is available unusually from the top here. If we look down what we've got down the side here, we're not seeing crop within the tools in there. It's actually at the top. So clicking that or you could press the C key for crop. And now you have something quite different than the old version, which is it has put around. I'll zoom out so we can see all of it. It's put handles around it. So as I move that in, you can see that it, instead of you drawing it, your starting point has completely changed. Your starting point now is you actually have a frame on there and you can start working with it. Now, in this image, obviously, what I want to do is get rid of that, that dead one. Not by doing that. Uh, I would want to take that down to there, move that down and move that inwards a bit. Uh, you're not going to play ball there, are you? No, I need to move you back in and move you across. But the thing is, as I'm doing that, I'm losing the um, ratio that the image was. And that's what these tools are for. So just to point out, because this is pervasive through the entire interface here, as I choose a tool, be it this crop tool from the top or one of the tools down the right hand side, this area changes and gives me options for this specific tool. In this case, it's allowing me to rotate. So that's all I can actually do there. So I'm going to take that back to zero because it was right in the first place. Come on, back to zero you go. But you also have presets and that's what these boxes are. You can force it to maintain the original aspect ratio and it automatically did that, which means as I scale this, it will maintain the original aspect ratio. I can force it to be square. I can choose 16.9. Uh, 916. And if you actually look at what you've got over here, these are actually giving you a preview that we have the long edge, the four by the short edge, the three. This one's the other way around and so forth. 
In this case, I would probably want a 16 9 ratio on there. And I would probably want to take that down to there. So my my grid, as I move that, I get a grid overlay. And I would want to put the head of that flower on one of the points in the middle. So that is just right. Or I might decide to move it up there depending on what I want. So that looks pretty decent. Now, the issue with doing that is I now have on the left hand side an area that has no content whatsoever. That's OK. You can use the crop tool to extend a canvas as well as to crop it down. So if I wanted to actually crop that image to that, all I need to do now is to hit the apply button at the bottom. And that's what I will do. And that then gives me my image. So now what we're looking at is a cropped version of my image. And the reason that we have this hashed pattern on the left hand side is that those pixels have been added to the image by cropping it. So it's a little bit reversed logic, but you've extended the image on the left hand side. But we have actually cropped that image down. I'm going to leave that image there because I'm going to come back to it to do certain things. But just to complete looking at the crop tool, um, because within the crop tool, we also have the ability to rotate. And that's another one of these machine learning things. So I am off screen on my other screen and I am looking for a very basic image just to show you what that is talking about. And here is my image, which is I have my original, I think that's the one. So I'm opening up an image, I'm trying to do it a different way now. So it opens up on the right screen. Thank you very much. Right. So I have a basic image, as we can see from that basic image. Someone had had one too many sangria when they took that. That's a horizon. And the feature that I'm talking about is horizon detection. And it promises the Pixelmator Pro, instead of you having to move that round, it promises it can do that for you. Right. How you do that. You go into the crop tool. So the C key, that button at the top. And there's your horizon slightly off. What you could do is use this and try and get it straight. Is that about right or is that about right? I'm not quite sure. Optical illusion wise, it's actually very difficult to get that precise. So what I'll do is I'll hit the reset button. Let's take it back to where it was and make sure we can see that there. In fact, I'll make it a little bit bigger by hiding the layers because we don't need to see the layers at the moment. What you have, though, is this little text here that says auto. It looks so innocuous. It does not look like a button, but it is. If I just press on that, it will make a best guess for you. And I was at minus 2.1, but it thinks minus 2.3. And it's probably right. It's actually done two things. It's rotated it for you. And I'm just going to zoom out a bit so we can actually see what it's done. The box, the square, the selection area that we had around the entire image has moved in a bit. If you accept this crop, you're going to lose the area down the left hand side, along the top, down the right hand side and along the bottom. So the yellow frame is your original image and the white frame with the handles on is your new image. You will lose pixels, but it will be completely square. So we will accept that. Hit apply. And when you go back to your image, your horizon is perfectly square, perfectly straight, rather. So it managed that OK. But I wasn't prepared to leave it there because I started having questions with, well, that one was easy. There was no people in it. There was no landscape in it. There wasn't a tree in the way. So how would it handle it if there were other issues in the way, should we say? So I had a couple of other images just to see how well it could cope. So I'm opening up another one and I wondered how it would cope with that one, given that the horizon isn't straight. It curves up at the edge on the left. It curves up at the edge on the right. Um, it, it's also not a C. So how would it manage? Would it be able to cope with that? So hit the C key and in here. Click that auto again. When I did, I thought, you know, that's not bad. That is not bad at all. My problem with that image was I felt I was losing quite a lot of it. Um, I can't really get any more than that. And if I was being precise, I have got some empty pixels on the right hand side. As I move that in, though, so I'm using this corner on the lower right and I move it in there, then I'm not needing to try and fill in any pixels, but I am losing an awful lot of pixels. So that's something that you might want to think about. 
Um, but it has straightened it. I didn't need to do anything. It's four, per uh, four degrees off. But as I do that, I've now got a perfectly straight horizon. So I was actually quite impressed at, at this point that it was doing a pretty decent job. It wasn't doing bad at all. There were images that it didn't do so well, but I wanted to play around and find out, you know, what, what it could do well. One of the ones that I used for that was, and I'm just looking for it, there it is there. I will open up this one. Now, this one's even trickier. Uh, this one was tricky for a few reasons. Let's take that up. Uh, there's person in it. It's very dark. Um, the horizon is behind the person. So how would it manage with something like that? So again, hit the C key, go in, just tap that auto once. It didn't do a bad job. It did not do a bad job. So I found this was pretty accurate. Applying that, I now have perfectly straight horizon, despite the fact there were other extra things in it. It suggested, however, cropping it in a certain way. And if we look in the top right hand corner, I have some um, now transparent pixels, which is a bit of a problem. But before I show you what we're going to do with that, because I, 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 there are options I have with that, I'm going to get another image to do it with, because this one was actually pre pretty impressive, this one. Right, uh, that is my original. Let's have a look that I've got the right one. I do. So I'm going to open up this one. And again, I what I'm trying to do with it is push it to the point of not being able to find the horizon. So this one was just some snow. So going in and cropping this one, hitting that auto button again, how did it do? It did pretty well. The only problem I'd got with this was I felt at this stage I was losing far too much of the image. And that was a problem I felt. So what I did with this one was say, let me bring it outwards. And as I bring it out, I don't know if you can sense that, but as I bring it out, it snaps to the corner. So as I'm extending it at the top, it snaps to the very edge, which is a nice feature. And I'll bring it down at the bottom. Obviously, the problem I've got with that is now I've got a lot of um, transparent pixels, but I'll go with it. I will apply it because I'll move on to show you with the other image and this image that if you are cropping and using the horizon detection, if we start to add in some of the other tools, you can start to create, well, fix a problem, really fix a problem here. And when we fix a problem, it's the repair tool that we start with. So over in the tools, we actually have a repair tool. And as I click on the repair tool, this tool actually is one of the most powerful in here and it's very little options for you to play with. So it's virtually automatic. It's about as automatic as it can get. What I'm going to do before I start using this repair tool, though, is I'm going to go back to my layers and look at my thumbnails and I'm actually going to add a repair layer. So I'm making a layer to put my repairs on and that way I can toggle it on and off. However, if I didn't, if I'd started to work on it and thought, oh, no, I've done it on that layer, which I do all the time. So here I am with my repair tool and I'll just go in there and start painting. And I'm not on the right layer. I'm on the original. Don't do it, woman. But I have. I've done it. We actually have an option to show original. So show it me without that bit on it and reset it. So all is not lost, but I'll keep my repairs separate. Now, if you're going to do what I do, which is keep a manual non-destructive thing, what you can do here is make sure that you have sample all layers on. If you do not have sample all layers on, this won't work. With it turned on, let's just do that again. Bear in mind, I'm on my blank layer. There it is. It will do it. If I have that toggled off, so let's take the toggle out and I do it not so much because there are no pixels. You need to sample all layers for that to work. So I will very roughly do this. This is not me at my best. This is me just throwing it in. Obviously didn't do the top corner, but sometimes with this thing, you're going to need to do a multiple passes, but it's not done a bad job. If you didn't know the original, if I toggle off the original, you'll think I can just see a pattern. But if you didn't, that's not bad at all. And we are talking about filling in here swathes and swathes of missing pixels. So let's add that bit back in. Not bad. Let's add the bit in at the bottom. And again, all I am doing is painting. I am not being precise. I'm, if I was doing this for real for a client, I'd be a lot. I'd be taking a lot more time than this. That is pretty good. Now, how good it does depends. It's it basically random. It's going to depend on precisely where you select. It's going to depend on the image. But that to me, 
I can't see the join particularly. I might decide to do something about that there. Actually, I think that looked better before. I might just, you know, change the size of the repair. Just try and get rid of that little bit there. But not bad at all. Where I thought it was going to really struggle was at the top. But let's give it a go. Let's give it some pixels to play with. If it doesn't work too well, I don't know if that will work well or not. No, not at all. What I would do is undo it and start again and either use a bigger area or a smaller area. Now, don't do that. That wasn't what I wanted you to do. So I'm bringing that across, taking it down. So a larger area or a smaller area. That's not bad. So I now start working on the rest of it. And really, it's trial and error. Now, that's appalling. I can either undo it or just go over the top of it. So it's a, it's about where you select that's going to be the difference here. Uh, you can use other tools. So let me just get rid of that bit there. You could use the stamp tool instead, but not bad, not bad. As I, as I work on it and I work outwards, I'm losing more of it and more of it. And I would get that back to the far edge in the end just by doing this and pushing those pixels out of the way and fixing that area at the top. Believe me, it was perfect in rehearsals. But then, isn't it always? Hey, OneNote was working in rehearsals. Right, not bad. Not 100% not, not there, but I would fix that. But I thought that wasn't bad at all. all. Right, just showing you that other one with the gentleman in it. Same principle. All I'd need to do here is make sure that I've got the repair tool selected, go over the area that has no pixels, and paint it in. Absolutely fantastic. I thought that was very, very good. Not bad at all. So let's close that one down, close that one down. I did have one open in here. That one. Mm, let's come back to this one, because in this one, there were no pixels. There are absolutely no pixels at all. So what you'd need to do in here is use the repair tool. I would add a blank layer to put my repairs on. I would double click and I would actually rename that to repairs. And then I would go in and I would start repairing it by putting more pixels in there. Not bad. There is a bit of a line there, so I would go over the line. I also think, looking at that, that the dark areas are too dark. So I would be looking to actually try and repair in terms of changing the colour of those areas. More like that. Now, what I would do with this is, as you can see, where it's got too much of a sharp edge, just go over it once more and lose the harshness of it. But no skill required. I'm not using um, a graphics tablet or anything, just the mouse. And now that doesn't look bad. If I toggle that off, that was what we started with. That was what we've got now. That needs a little bit of a fix, but not bad. Not bad. So that's a repair tool. It really couldn't be easier to use. Now, while I've got this image open, let's have a look at some of the other tools. All right, this image itself down there. Right, uh, let's move that a little bit. I'm still working here on the thumbnails. And as you can see, with the thumbnail selection, you can get those really quite large which is large enough to see the actual contents of them. Right, in here you have other tools. So working down these tools, I'm looking for a tool that will enable me to sharpen that image. And I actually have a sharpen tool. I'm going to click on that. That is my sharpen tool. It will let me sharpen that image. But before I do that, I want to show you that if you click on the sharpen tool again, it opens up and it gives me two other tools. So it has a soften tool and a smudge tool. How you know they're there is because there is a disclosure triangle. It's ever so tiny. It is ever so tiny in the bottom right hand corner, but it's there. Some have them, some don't. The erase tool does, the repair tool doesn't. So if it has one of those, then it will. you click it and it will show you extra tools. I'm interested in the sharpen tool though. So I'm going to bring that over to my dandelion and I'm going to start sharpening it there. And I'm going to hope that works. Uh, I might need actually to be on there. Let's do that on there. So let's bring that in and that's sharpening up. That is sharpening up. I'm only doing the middle bit, but that is sharpening up. If you want to be sure, make sure that, that has done something, you have this show original. So I'm just going to toggle that on and off. That has made a difference. I hope you can see that on the video. It has made a difference. You can in here change the strength of it. So if you want to take that right up and really go for it in the middle there, you should start to see a very, very, very high contrast. And actually, it's not the best now. That's not the best. But you will see a huge difference with that now. So that's that's sharpening it. Conversely to sharpening it, you could soften it. So if I wanted to soften these edges more, 
I could just go around the edges and really kind of blur away by softening it. So blur those pixels there around the edges to make a bigger difference. So just really showing you a couple of the tools that you actually have there. And then looking at the image there. So let's go back and have a look at our images. What else did I have here? Right. Now we've looked at the repair tool, but we've done it in terms of filling in swathes of images, uh, swathes of missing, missing pixels, really. So opening up another image and showing you that you can actually use the same repair tool. You don't need different tools. You just have this same single repair tool to actually do very fine repairs on an image as well. So I'm adding a new layer at the top and I'm moving into my image here and to move in and going to make that even smaller than that. I'm using the square bracket keys to scale that up and down. And as I go across this, it will repair it. So I'm repairing little bits there. He's made a mess while he's eating and that was hanging off his bamboo. So let's just fix that there. Again, using exactly the same principles. Just do that and to tidy it up. Now, I took about 10 minutes with this image when I was seeing what this tool was capable of and, and what the final results would look like. And I ended up with something that didn't look like it. I'd made much of a difference. You've got this bit over here as well. And there was a bit there, but I took quite a time with it. Oh, I'm glad it's done that. I can show you that as well. I took a lot of time with it and it did actually make quite a bit of a difference to the finished image. It just made the difference between it being a snapshot and a professional shot. So as you can see, I'm tidying up the edges by taking the bamboo out. By turning off the layer, so um, let me go back to show you the list view so I can toggle it on and off quite easily. You can see it does actually make a huge difference to the image, but there is a fault with Pixelmator Pro at the moment. I did this quite spectacularly, scared me to death. If I just zoom in to this part of the image that I actually corrected, which was this um, bit of his bamboo here, and toggle that layer back on, you'll notice that the bamboo's gone but I've, I've acquired an artifact. What on earth is that? Well, I can only tell you it's random. It's not correct. There is a fault with Pixelmator Pro. I ended up with one image having the whole top of it distorted. It, it looks like um, snow on an old videotape. It's a fault. That's all I can tell you. It's a fault. It shouldn't be there. Shouldn't look like that at all. Now it is. So that's a problem. But because I put it on a separate layer, when I toggle off my repairs, it's not there. So I know that this is isolated to my repair layer. So handily, I couldn't have forced it to do that. So very well done. Um, handily, I've got another tool that I can use to correct that, which is I have an erase tool. When I have my erase tool, I can move that over the layer and start erasing. Now to do that, I need my erase tool and I want something here. It's fairly large. Let's go for 150. And uh, hopefully get rid of that. You're not erasing for me. Why aren't you erasing? What am I doing? Yeah, I'm right. I uh, might want it a little bit softer. But apart from that, I do want you 100 percent. And I do want you basic. Why aren't you erasing? Let's go a little bit tighter. Oh, it's not erasing. Right. So it obviously is really a problem. But I did manage to erase that last time. If it won't, if you're trying to use this and it's got this fault, if it won't, let's try something else because it's not playing ball. Right up on your layers, you can actually add a mask to this. So the ability to add a mask is there. Having added a mask to it, I would then use the brush tool with my default colors and making sure I have the mask selected, not the repair layer itself. And you can see the blue frame indicates which is active. I should be able to paint on my mask and lose the contents underneath it. So as you can see, all this that shouldn't be there, I'm only forced to do this because Pixelmator Pro is broken, all right? You can actually hide those faults. So if your repairs were amazing, but now you've acquired these artifacts, you can actually get rid of the artifacts. So there we go. Shouldn't be forced to do this, should I? But at least it's enabled me to show you two other features. So if I just show you up there, that's my repair. Not the, not the neatest repair I've ever done, but it's done the job. It has done the job. OK, so that was little things. That was repairing little things. We've already seen adding in elements to completely blank areas of an image. But 
What if you had bigger areas to deal with, bigger areas where you need something removing? How good is it at those? And I've got a couple of images just to show you that it couldn't be easier. It absolutely could not be any easier. So I've got an image here and there's two elements of this image that I want to remove. Uh, and I'm going to put in a layer to do my repairs on. Again, I'm just going to grab that repair tool and I'm just going to go over that. Did not want to do that. Wanted to take out the whole thing all at once. So literally just go over the area I wanted rid of. And I tend to work from the outside in. And when I let go, it's absolutely fine. There is a little bit of a mark there. Looks like a dirty smudge, but it has fixed it. The other area on this image that I would want to work with is this bit, which is a little trickier. So just draw over it. If you can move your mouse, you can do this. This used to be a huge skill and now it isn't. You just need to be able to move a mouse and the software will do the rest of it. And there you go. Can't see they were ever there. In fact, you can. I'm lying. Right. There's a bit of a mark. Just go over it again because it's random. So if you're not happy with the job it does, just go over it a little bit more and get rid of any artefacts and you're good to go. Right. In the same vein, let me have a look. I'm not going to do the easy one. I'm going to go for something that's horrifically difficult. And indeed, the first time I did it, didn't like it. Did not like it at all. So let's show you how you can fix certain things as well. With this one, I wanted to get incredibly ambitious. I want to move the whole lot. I want to remove the window and the radiator. Let me show you that that doesn't work. I'm just going to do this very quickly. So it's not going to be the best selection ever. But the reason I'm doing it quickly is to show you it didn't work. So as I'm going over it, I've got all the area I want to remove. That's the good news. But because I'm using such a big brush, I'm taking out part of the floor. Those floorboards I'm taking with it. Now, don't prove me wrong now. You're having a good old think about this, aren't you? But the problem that I had with it was, my good, I can show you. Absolutely fantastic if you're looking at the wall. If you're looking at that floor, not good. No matter what I did with it, I could not get that floor straight. So, bit of a problem. We did what I considered to be the difficult part in getting rid of the window. Rest of it, not quite so much. So here's what you do in those circumstances. Let's bring it back. I just hit undo. I'm going to bring myself a new layer and do it on a new layer. But I'm going to do one thing first, which is I'm going to look at this floor. Actually, that doesn't stick out very far. So I don't need to select any of the floorboards. But with a round brush, it's going to be very difficult not to select any of the floorboards. So zoom out. What I'm going to do is restrict the area I can work with with the marquee tool. So by going along the floorboard there, the skirting board, and up to the top, I'm saying only work on that middle bit. Do not work on the rest of it. So now I'm going back for my repair tool. I'm going to leave the brush at exactly the same size because it didn't do a bad job at the top, did it? It's quite all right there. But now, even though I'm going down and I'm going right outside the lines, it's helping me. It's not letting me go outside that line at the bottom. And I've left the middle bit. Oh, honestly. <laughs> oh, well, there'll be a white square in the middle, which I will go back and do now. Yes, we don't want that, do we? All right, let's get rid of the middle bit. Where you go. Bye bye. All right, it's done it. Now I'm pressing Command and D and losing that marquee. And now I've got no problem with the floorboard. There's no indication that that was ever there. Window gone. Um, edge of that gone. Ooh, ooh, look at that. Naughty, naughty, naughty. It's done that. Right, what I will do to fix that is just go over that bit there and hopefully it will take that away. There we go. So all gone. Massive area fixed with the same repair tool that I used to fix tiny little pixel areas. Oh, God. So... That is pretty good. The only thing I had to remember with that, it was actually look at it logically. If it's not doing what you want, try and think about how you could restrict the area it's working on or give it a better sample or work on a bigger area or a smaller area. But as I say, by working on a layer, you can toggle it on and off. So I can toggle that window back on and off. If I turn the background off, you can see the repair. That's the actual repair because I kept it on a separate layer. So that's the way I prefer to work with that. So that was the repair tool. We love the repair tool. Right. The next one I'm going to show you is the quick selection tool. This is another one that um, they're really pushing. We have a quick selection tool. So uh, let's have a look at some things we can select. First of all, I'm going to open that image. Then I'm going to add something to that and then work with that one.
And the something I am going to add to that is I'm going to go up to my add and choose. I'm going to go down to my images and it's quick selection tool I'm after. And I am after this one, which is my high jump image, which it thinks is a bird. Notice the automatically layered named layers. Nice try. Not quite. A bat, a raven, an eagle. Yeah, no, you're nowhere near, but I'll leave it alone. So not always accurate. Right. What I need to do with this one is I'm going to turn off that background layer because we're concentrating on this chap here who is jumping over that. And let me get these layers out of the way. Right. So this area is what I need to select. And I have a selection tool. It is the quick select tool. Notice there is a disclosure triangle. So you have select by color as well. So you can either do a quick selection, in which case I might want to select the yellows and the oranges. And as I draw around, it's adding to my selection. And with this image, that's not bad at all. I would have to select that middle bit. And then around the fingers, I would need to go in and make sure that I select little tiny bits of it. So as you get closer to it, you can be more precise with your selection. The thing is that selected the orange pixels on the outside. If I wanted to delete those pixels, that's absolutely fine. All I need to do is press the backspace key and they've gone. Notice Mr. Bit top right. We'll deal with that. Also Mr. Bit in the middle, but I'm going to undo that. Another way of doing it would be to invert my selection, which is command shift and I. And I'm not sure if that's good or bad or indifferent. So what I'm going to do is start again. Do it a completely different way. What I'm looking at here is I just want to select the black bit. Maybe that would be a better bet. And it is. It, it will select that in one apart from the lace at the bottom, which I would need to go in. But if I just click, it makes a very good job of selecting that. So that would be another way to do it. Then what I would need to do is to come in here and maybe even change the size of this. But look, as I'm moving, the yellow area is where it's going to select. So if I use those square bracket keys to make that smaller and then click, it should have half of that and then click and it should have half of that. You're not doing it, are you? Come on. Have you got it? Nearly got it? Almost got it. You almost have. Just one tiny bit more to select. And yeah, that's not done a bad job there. Right. And then come out. So it's got the bit that I want. So really, it's up to you how you make a selection. But the quick selection tool really takes a lot of the heavy lifting for you. Right. The other way to do that is in this image, really, the part that I want. So I'll just deselect is very much black. So if I do a select color and then just sample the color, it's actually made a great selection. I only needed to click once to do that. It's got the lace and everything. Just zooming in to show you. Very, very good. Very good selection. So two tools that can help you, but both based on the quick selection tool. Right. I'm going to press command and C. I have copied the pixels I have selected. I now need to put them on another layer. So I'm going to turn him off. I'm going to deselect and to add a layer. And then I'm going to paste and hopefully paste those pixels in. But you're not having it, are you? You're not doing it for me. Oh, you bad, bad software. Right. What I will do with that is go back to my birdie here. Right. Let's do that again, which isn't a bird, is it? But never mind. Right. Having selected him, command and I, which inverses it. Backspace key gone. I've got exactly what I need. And command and D to deselect. He has a lot of fringing on him. That's not great. There's lots of ways I could fix that. I'm not going to actually worry particularly about fixing it, but if I did undo, so I've got it selected and I go around and I undo again. So I've got just him selected. I've got just you. I've got just you selected. If I move in there to right at the edge, the bit within this. So I'm moving that just down there so you can see it. The little bit within the marching ants is what's giving it the orange fringe. You can refine your selection with the refine selection button. And by doing that, you can expand your selection. You can make the edges softer. You can bring them in or take them out. So I'll make it a little bit softer because it really doesn't matter. I can change the shape by rounding it. So I can actually do quite a bit there with it. What I'm going to do is zoom out so I can see the whole thing. Don't want him too soft, to be honest. I can also do a smart refine and let the software do it for me. And I could expand my selection or contract my selection. And as I do that, you can see his hands disappearing and the lace is disappearing. So it's a matter of keeping that as far as I can and making sure I've got selected what I want. 
So at the minute, I've lost his laces at, at 14 percent. But if I add it in, you can just see his laces coming back into the selection in the middle there. So I'm moving that to try and get that. So have a play around with it. It's going to depend. It's going to be on a very much on a per image basis. Um, but you've refined your selection. And as I go in, let's have a look how that is. That's actually not going to have too much in the way of a fringe on it. It's not going to be too bad. But that hasn't got his laces, has it? Naughty, naughty. Right, so I've got what I want there. So I'll do that again, just losing the background and deselecting and not worrying about my fringe. Turn my background on. Well, that's not bad, but he's too small and he's going the wrong way. And that's where this comes back in, which is, um, this is the, it's usually the select tool. But remember in here, it's actually now the arrange tool. And within here, I get handles so I can scale it. So I can uh, scale him in that way. Uh, I can rotate and I've also got options here to flip. I can flip up and down or I can flip left to right. And that's much better. I actually want him there. I'm zooming out so I can see all of it. And he needs to be much bigger. I'm actually sort of going to take him up to that point. Now he's his foot over there so we can see he's just coming into shot and jumping over that. So about that. Obviously not the best selection I've ever made, but you get the idea. You get the idea of how powerful the quick selection tool is. OK, so I have done that one. All right, let's have another look. Right. I've got a couple of images that show saturation and desaturation. So what I'm going to do is close down that one. Don't need to keep him. I have no idea how many images I've got open here now. Let's just delete all these. We can always go back and do those again if we need to, which we don't right at this second. Let's just minimise him. Uh, might come back to that one. So let's open one of these. I've got two images here that are quite similar in terms of colour. So I'm just opening up the first one and making that full screen. Right, this is to show you another feature, another tool. So I'm adding a new layer to put it on. In here you have the saturation option, which is within the repair, clone, soften, lighten, saturate and warp, you have saturate. As I click on there, Disclosure triangle. So click again. I have desaturate. So you can saturate and desaturate. All right. So I'm just going to show you this tool. You do get the option for, to change the strength of what you're about to do. This image is very nice, but it's quite insipid in terms of colour. If I could add a bit of colour to that, that would uh, be much better. So I am attempting here. What am I doing there? Where are we are. We're saturating, aren't we? Come on. Yep, I want you to do it all. I want you to do it all. Uh, I know what your problem is. I need to go over to here. There we go. Uh, there we go. That's much better. You can start to see the detail coming back into it. And as I just quickly go over that, but I'm I'm leaving the right hand side alone. You can see it's breathing life into this image with a saturate tool. Only thing I'd say with a saturate tool is go easy with it because it's cumulative. As I do that again, it starts to get very lurid. And if I were to do it again and again, it would become nuclear winter. So um, it, it's great if you've got a very specific area and you're happy to just tweak it with that. But there are better ways to work with it. There are better ways to work with colour than using those tools. They are old style tools now. There is far better ways to work. But just to complete the picture with the desaturate, I'm going to do exactly the same on this other end. And this time it's taking the colour away. So it's going sort of quite black and white almost. And again, it's cumulative. So as I go over here in these trees, the colour is leaving the building. You can go over the bit you've overdone and mute it a little. It never quite gets back to where it was before, though, uh, because you've added and now you're taking away. But you're actually taking away from what you've added. So it never actually returns to what it was. But there are tools, there's the light and tool, the dark and tool and, and tools like that that can help you work with it. But one of the amazing new features in here will help you work much faster. And that is to create a recipe and work with an image. So what I'm going to do is close that image down. We don't want to save that one, but I will open it up again. So I'm starting completely from scratch with the same image. This time I'm going to use a different tool set. I am moving down the tools and within here I have adjust colours. Now, if you've used a photo application on your iPad, you'll be used to having recipes or looks and you choose sort of vibrant, smoky, um, ethereal and mainly for like Instagram kind of looks. 
Okay, you have here noir, you have smoky. And what you're doing is you're applying not just a desaturation or a gradient or a lighten or a darken. You're applying a whole range of colour adjustments in one go. And that's why I say they're like a recipe. As we go through, we've got vivid, we've got calm, we've got loud, we've got dramatic, we've got rosy, we've got fiery. There's all sorts in here, vintage. So these are the kind of names you will see in other things. OK. Uh, I thought mellow was quite nice. Uh, it added to it. When you've added any of these, you click again to turn them off. So it's once to toggle it on, once to toggle it off. You can then start to tweak the presets or create one completely from scratch. So at the moment, I don't have anything selected at all. I'm at the top. I've got non-selected, non-applied. Let's have a look what makes up that recipe. Well, it's in here in the info area of the Adjust Colors tool. And you have two things that are applying at the moment. Well, actually, they're not because we've not applied them. But there's two things are here, here color adjustment wise to apply. There is a white balance and there is lightness and you can toggle off the details. See there you can remove the adjustment so you can remove both of those. At the moment, though, they're not actually doing anything. So there's no tick in the box at the moment. You can toggle them on and off with a tick in the box. So let's start work on this image. This time you're doing, you're not starting off with one of these recipes, one of these looks. You're starting off on your own. So at the top here, we've got the histogram. Let's turn the white balance on and have a play with it. Let's make it much warmer. Let's make it much cooler. So as you change this here, you're changing your image. So I would probably want that a bit warmer. And to make it warmer, I'd probably make it a little, little bit more red. But I could go green. Oh, it's the 70s all over again. Uh, but I wouldn't take it too far because, it, you know, it's not really going to work with that. This is really just to adjust your white balance. Then you can work through your lightness with your exposure. So do you want it more exposed, less exposed? So in this case, it probably doesn't need much in the way of exposure. You can adjust the highlights. Do you want to bring the highlights in or take them down? It could do with a little bit of highlight adjustment. You can adjust the shadows. So darken your shadows or lighten your shadows. Again, it's not too bad in terms of shadows. So I don't think it needs much there. You've got your brightness. So you can add your brightness to it. Again, don't think it needs much in that way. Contrast wise, though, if I add contrast to it, it starts to look much punchier. So much more lively, a much better image, sharper in a way. And I can also change that black point. So if I take that down, it goes a lot less contrasty. So if I bring it up a little bit, again, it makes that image much better. But by this stage, I've forgotten what the original looked like. Handily at the bottom, I have a show original button so I can toggle it on and off and see, am I heading in the right direction with this image? I actually think I am. I don't think that's too bad at all. If I don't like it at all, I can use the reset and reset it. But I'm halfway through setting it up and I'm not changing my mind. So I've used white balance and I've used lightness. But these recipes can be incredibly complicated and not just rely on those few settings there. There's eight sliders to change there. But at the top, you have an add button and you can actually add any of the other adjustment types. So we have hue and saturation, color balance, colors, replace color, levels, curves, channel mixers, all sorts. So one of the things that I might want to do with that is play with the levels and the curves. So bringing it down here, I see the levels. I can tweak those levels in a little bit, moving the black and white points there. That's quite nice. If I want to show the original, I've got my show original button. But if I just want to turn off one element of the recipe, I take the tick out of it and that toggles it on and off. Just that individual component. And I can keep adding to this recipe because I don't know about you, but I always add curves as well, just for good measure. And I like to put a sort of slight S curve on it, a very gentle S curve. And again, I can toggle that on and off. Yep, that's made a difference. It's retained the punchiness of it, but it's actually made it a little bit lighter. And you can carry on, you know, go crazy. Add everything you want, whatever you want. You want to add some sharpen to it, some grain to it. You want to replace a colour or the hue and saturation. You can do anything like that. So um, there's my hue and saturation, which is up there. So I could actually really boost the saturation that we could go crazy. <sighs> mustn't do that. Mustn't do that. But we could certainly add to that. It would take that and it would probably take some vibrance as well. Now, if I look at the show original, 
Huge difference. Absolutely huge difference. But that's because that what you're looking at now is the original image plus a huge range of adjustments that you've added. You've got the white balance, the lightness, the hue and saturation, a levels adjustment and a curves adjustment. And if you took, because you will have done, more than one image while you were there taking that image, you might want to apply that recipe to all of those images. Be good if you could do that, wouldn't it? Well, you can. By going down to the bottom of the list, you have an option here to add your own configuration. And what that will do is whatever is set in the panel in the middle between the tools and the presets, so what is currently applied to this image, it will add as a preset for you. So I'm going to call this preset Elaine, because I can. So that's now my preset. Now, because it's safely secured in there, I could apply Mellow or Vintage and then go back to my settings without losing them. That is an amazing time saver. But it gets better than that. Right, first of all, I'll show you why that's so important by opening up another image which was taken of the same location. It's not quite as washed out as that one was. Why am I adding it to that? I am trying to open you in Pixelmator Pro. There we go. So this is a new image that I've added. Let's get that full screen. It probably doesn't need to be quite uh, as affected by a colour change as the other one, but it, it does look a bit murky. If I scroll down these settings, there's my Elaine setting at the bottom. And I can apply it. Oh boy, a little bit too much. But what I've done in essence is, is set that up on one image and then apply it to another image. Great time saver. Gets better than that. Oh, I know it's unbelievable. It does get better than that. Because I've got this on this Mac that I'm demonstrating to you. But of course, tomorrow I'm going to be out on the road and I'm going to use my MacBook Air. If I can get Pixelmator Pro running on it, obviously. Um, back to the metal problem. If, but if I can, I'm not going to have this saved. Oh dear. And I'm, there's no way I'm going to remember what those settings were. I'd love to take this with me. It's like picking up your paints and going out painting. And you can do that as well by right clicking on it and hitting the export option. And if I export it, it says colour adjustment. Um, I'm going to call it Elaine's colour. And I'm putting the U in because I'm British. And I will put that on my desktop so we can see it. So stick it on my desktop and export. And that has exported my configuration settings. I've not saved the image at this point. OK, but if I move this out of the way and get rid of all these other images at the back, there is what I've exported. It is an adjustment. It actually says adjustments on it. It is an adjustment recipe that I have saved. And I would then put that somewhere, probably iCloud or Dropbox. And when I want it on my other machine, I will put it on my other machine or share it with you. Mm, I can do that too. In fact, I can just do that like that because I've got a little app there called Dropler. What that will do for me is upload it and it will put um, an ex uh, URL on my clipboard, at which point, hopefully, she said by going to a browser and paste pasting it in, I can go and paste that into the chat. So those who are with us live, you will go be able to go and download that if you want. So there it is in the chat. You can download that right now. You'll be able to do anything with it, obviously, unless you get Pixelmator Pro. But if you have, you can load it in and, and play around with it. If you haven't, you can download it and see what it actually looks like, etc. So you can do that. Bear in mind as you work with Pixelmator Pro, it's not just adjustments it can do that with. It can do all kinds of things and save them out and share them. It's amazing. So we've looked at uh, saturation and desaturation, colour adjustments. Going to look at adding effects because that's somewhere else that you can use um, presets. So I'm going to use the same file. Might as well while I'm here. And I am going over and choosing a different tool, which is down the bottom. I have over here. So let's make that active. There we go. I have down here effects. And at the moment, there are no effects on this. But again, it works in exactly the same way, exactly the same principle. An effect, there are presets on the left. There is the actual effect components in the middle. And then you've got your tools on the right hand side. And you can add elements to your effects to, to create effect recipes. So let's have a look at some of these because we've got some presets here. So we have the ability to, to miniaturize it. 
in that way. Or we can make it very silly. We can add all of these things to it. The one that, I mean, these are just ludicrous. Uh, the one that I thought wasn't a, a bad idea to have available is this digital one. Takes us back to the late 80s, to be honest, in terms of quality of an image. But it makes it, it pixelates it. One of the ones that you probably will use, though, is the vignette. So in here, you have two things at play. You've got your vignette at the top with your radius. So very, very much dark to very light around the edges. So take that down to where you want it. You have the intensity slider. So you can go bright or you can go dark. So let's make it so we can actually see it. So let's take it up to 70%. You also have the fall off, which is how intense that effect is. You know, how, how muddy are the edges? So let's set that to there. The second element you have is focus. And you don't need that. You can just turn that off if you don't want it. But you could actually there blur that around the edges as well. So if I want it very blurred and then I can change the transition between the two so I can have it very sharp. Right. So if I do that, it's very sharp or I can take it down a bit so it's not quite so sharp. There we go. So you can actually make changes to that. And that's an effect that, again, you can save. So having made some changes to that now, that's not how it was before. So uh, if I I'm gonna have that a little bit darker there. Bring it back in a minute. Yeah, So we can really see it. So I've made my own custom configuration for that. And again, I can choose to add that. I won't call this one Elaine because you will already have one called Elaine. But this one I'll call dark edges. There we go. Let's be descriptive. Dark edges. And I can do the same thing. I can export that. I can put that on my desktop and call that dark edges. And it will have saved it to my desktop. This time it will have an effects icon. So each one has their own different effects and they have a different extension as well. And I can do exactly the same with that as I did with the other one. So if you are watching live and if not, I'll put these in the uh, description later. Uh, I will put them up there so you can have a play around with them. Hopefully that has copied to my clipboard. Let me check that that is indeed the right one. It is. And I'm putting it in the chat right now. So if you do want to have a play around with these, because it will show you how you can actually load them in. Uh, which you can do. So we've got two of those things saved out there. So that was adding your effects. I'm going to come back to effects very shortly. Um, we'll probably be going for another 10 to 12 minutes, I would expect. I'm going to look at text because text is one of the most amazing things that they have added to Pixelmator Pro in terms of how they've changed it. So I, I'm going to open up another file. Um, when you're working with images, text has really been a kind of We've forgotten. We've forgotten about text. You know, put your text on, whatever, do whatever you need with it. But it's not a desktop publisher. It's not a word processor. So you don't really have much in the way of configuration with, with the thing. What I've got here is something to work with, which is this actually is a slide. And I wanted to have the title of my presentation uh, much jazzier than that is. But I've done the rest of my work in here. What I actually want it to look like, uh, I've got, here's one I did earlier, which is I want it to look like that. So I have got the right font. The font is called phosphate. But the text that I've actually got here, this isn't really formatted in that way at all. So what I need to do is to format the text. So having added the text, I'm going to select the text and then start to format it. So I actually want this to be the phosphate font. So um, that's not easy to say either. The phosphate font. And that's not too bad in terms of size, but obviously this one here needs to be much bigger than that. So go back and choose that again. And then so it, it gets messy fast, doesn't it? I've got to go and find the same font again. Oh, that's a, such a pain. It'd be nice if all these recipes I can create, I could create some for the text. Well, look what we've got between the image canvas and the settings. We have title, head, subtitle, body. These are styles. They are starting point styles. And yes, you can create your own. But first of all, let's see how they work. The text I have selected, I choose one of these styles and it formats it for me. And that format is a recipe. It's a recipe of everything that you see in these settings. It's a recipe of the font face, uh, whether it's bold italic underline, the size, the color, the alignment, the spacing, all of it. It's a, it's a recipe of all of it. So this one here that was actually the correct font is a pretty much a starting point. So I'll just make a style. Just hit plus. That's it. I've done it. 
It gives me a, a title of, of text, which isn't exactly descriptive. So if I put, um, I'll put presentation to show you a limitation of this. You only have a certain amount of space. That's a bit of a pain. But apart from that, it's very good and it works brilliantly. All I need to do now is to go in and select my other text and click on my preset and it will apply it for me, which gives me a great starting point to take the name, which is the location that we're going to, which is Ginger, and just change the size. So I can double click in there, make that about 200. I could probably make that a little bit bigger actually, couldn't I? Let's make that 250. Great. And then put Uganda, Africa a little bit bigger. So I'm using the styles and changing them slightly for the little bits that I want to be different. But I have a style for it. So wherever I'm creating assets for this presentation, instead of repeatedly having to go in and go and find the font and change the size and all of that, I have a standard font that is 44 pixels and phosphate. And anything else that I wanted it to be, I have a starting point. Be aware, though, that if I come in here, like to this bit at the bottom, and I change it. So I, I don't want it black. I would like it red. Terrible design idea, but I will. I'll make it red. And I want this font to be red every time I start to use it. I've got here a way to update the style. So at the moment, if I if I put some more text in, so let me click over here and put some text in. It will come in red. That was the last color that I used. But if I apply the style to it, it will be black. But if I want that style to automatically apply red, I need to go and redefine it. And to do that, two steps. First step, select an area where the text looks like you want it to look and then right click and hit redefine. That has now redefined the previews updated. If I go and choose my text and hit the option, it will update. But notice what didn't happen. This is not Word. It did not update where the, the style had previously been applied. Previously, this had been had the presentation style applied to it. It did not automatically get changed to red. These are not auto updating styles. They are starting point styles. But that's fine. At least there's a style. And guess what? Guess what you can do with them? You can right click on them and you can export them. So what I've started to do in iCloud and Dropbox is create a folder of my settings. So that says text style. Uh, it would actually be presentation text. So I give it a name and I save that to my desktop. What I'm doing is them uploading them to iCloud or um, Dropbox. And then I have them available when I'm out on the road and I, I think, ah, I need that style. I can't remember what the font was. I've got them with me. So very powerful to be exporting these things, to be saving them out as well. Now, while we're here uh, looking at fonts and text, I will get here a new text layer. So we're now going to use that new text layer, but I'm going to put it right at the top of that stack and I'm going to turn off uh, my text from there. So I'm only looking at my background. I don't want that. That's what I want there. So I have my text in the middle here and really just showing you uh, a couple of things that you can do with text in here. And I'm going to make this much, much bigger to do it with. Even bigger than that, I'll go for about 500. There we go. Right. And I'm going to move that now. Right. When you have text, that text is editable. If I double click it, I can change that text. What I can't do, do with it while it's editable text is, I'm trying to think of the actual way to explain this, but do certain things with it um, in terms of design. Be very designy with it. Editable text is great if you want to edit it, but if I want to make that word text a logo, it's actually quite difficult to um, manipulate a single instance of it, but you do have a couple of options here. With your text tool selected and the text that you want to change selected, you have two options at the bottom right. You have convert into shape and convert into pixels. Um, if you convert it to pixels, you literally convert that to pixels. So um, it's adding that. But basically, I now have a layer with pixels on it. So I now can't edit the words. I can't edit the letters. So I'm going to undo that. 
What I tend to do if I want to manipulate it in some kind of way is not make it pixels. I convert it into a shape. That's slightly different, just to show you the difference. Now up here, I do have what looks like a layer, looks exactly the same as a pixel one, but I have a disclosure triangle. And what it's done is I have a different uh, layer for each letter now. That enables me to do clever things like this. Not bad. That's not clever. That's not clever at all. I need my arrange tool. Double click to select just the one character. And I can actually change it in terms of now it might look a bit like a logo or I could make that really skinny or I could make it much bigger. So what I could do is hybrid of the two, make it like that and put that in there because that is a shape. It is now a shape and I can manipulate it as such. You also have in here other shapes. So you have the ability to add shapes. If you want to add shapes, you've got your draw option where you can uh, where have you gone? Where have you gone? I want to see rectangles and things like that. You can uh, actually draw these things in here. So if you want a star, you can. Are you not adding a star for me? Why are you not adding a star for me? I think I turned off um, that, didn't I? That was my problem. I, I had it bringing up a nice little panel and I think I turned it off. So really, I want to see my shapes. Where are you? Where have you put it? Shapes. Uh, you're under the show. I don't want to show that. I want to see the actual thing. Show shapes. There we are. Show my shapes. I turned it off. So there are my shapes. And you'll notice I have an X. I made that earlier. I have an X. And at the moment it's yellow. But if I change the colour of it, you can see my X. How did I add that? How did I create that? Well, with an element selected. So in this case, I'll make the E a shape. With that E selected, Let's say I want to make it much skinnier, but with it selected, I can uh, right click on that. Uh, no, I can't. No, I can't. I'm lying. I need to go over to my shapes, right click on there and say add shape. And when I do that, uh, I now have an X under me. I must have had both selected. Let's go and get the T. So I've only got the T and let's add that. Add a shape. And it's added me another one at the bottom. Now I've got all of them selected. I've no idea what you're playing at, at the moment. You shouldn't be doing that. I probably deleted the others, didn't I? Let's do that. Let's make this work. Come on. Let's get rid of the X. Ah, you see, you're taking away both. You cheating thing. There we go. I only have the T. You should not add anything but the T now. Add a shape. And there is the T at the bottom. That means I can add that T back. And now it's a shape. I can add it wherever I want. And I've added it into this. You can, of course, if you, if you, you had a logo, uh, like we did have. So let me just undo all of that, get back to the fact that we had the text when it was just like that. I could make that by double clicking on it, making that a little bit skinnier, make it a little bit bigger. And let's say that's my company logo and I use it all over the place and I don't want to keep drawing it. What you can do with it selected, the whole thing, all four characters is go and add a shape and get all four characters. And now on here, I can delete the original. So it's all gone. But I have a shape and I can add it from the shapes. And guess what? I can export that. I can right click on it, export it and put in logo. And it will save that out to the desktop as well. So now I can have a library of those as well. OK, so text. Amazing. Right. One more demo. One last thing, because this is this is cool. Love this. This is an effect that's well worth seeing that you will probably use quite a bit. Right. What I've got here is let me find the right image. I need that one, which is I've got a Photoshop file. This Photoshop file was free online, I think. I've got links. I will share those links. I will try and remember where to put those links to share them. Come on, I want you full screen. Right, this is when I want to do a mock-up and I have this Photoshop file and it's telling me to use a smart object, but Pixelmator Pro doesn't support smart objects. Oh dear. But what I can do is add a layer, just a normal layer, not a smart object, just a layer. Um, and I want to choose it to choose it from an image and I am telling it, come on, I want you to choose it from over there. It is my perspective transform. There's my image. I took this image earlier. I won't do it live. It probably upset the network, but um, that's my iPhone. And uh, what I would need to do with that is make a mock up of this. And it's actually quite simple. If you look at that, it even snaps to it. That's because it's snapping to the contents of the layer. That doesn't actually look bad. It's not bad. Needs a smidging up a smidge in there, I think. Uh, that's not bad. But of course, it's easy, isn't it? 
when it's straight. It's not quite so easy when it's not. So let's have a look at one that's not. And I think that was number seven. Yeah, number seven. Awesome. So I'm opening up another file. And this one is definitely not so easy. So let's take that full screen. It's still telling me I've got a smart object to put on there, etc., etc. But first thing I need to do, go and choose it. Choose my screenshot. Insert it. And no matter how I rotate that, which I can do, I can rotate it, it's not going to work. You know, you can pretend, but it's not going to work. This is where you use an effect that if I go down to here and we look down here, I've got, I've got effects. These are pre-configured, aren't they? We've seen them all before. There's my dark edges. But the one I'm looking for is not there. So they've hidden it. If I go back and choose insert and choose effect, the one that's right down at the bottom under other is perspective transform. Let's add that. And it's got puppet strings. It's great. We've got connection points here and each one of these connection points has a puppet string attached to somewhere in here which is the top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And as I grab hold of that, the string moves. And so does that element of the image. I'm not going to even worry about being that precise. I'm just going to drag these so they are virtually in the right place. Each one moves completely independently of the others. I can even flip that over. Just putting them as near correct as I can get. And that means you can use perspective transform to do clever things like that. And as I zoom in, I can get very precise as to how I position that. So there's the gray bit. I need my green bit to match that. And all I need to do is to zoom in to each corner and do that to get it as perfect as I can, just working with what was already there. So I'm literally just, I'm using my mouse to move around this. So put that in the top corner, one last corner to go. And I should have something that looks pretty accurate. I wasn't far off, but enough so it wasn't quite right. Command and zero to see the whole lot and then go and get the arrange tool so I lose the puppet strings. And it looks awesome. It's amazing. I can even drag my screenshot behind the reflection and that makes it merge in even better. And it doesn't matter how complicated or how skewed um, your image is that you're trying to add it to. So we've got one here that's even more skewed than that one. And it, it's you just do the same thing. You literally just do the same thing. So uh, last demo, go to choose, choose exactly the same image again, which was that one. Insert it, go to insert effects down to the bottom one, perspective transform, grab the corner, shove it as near the right place as possible. And when you've done that, zoom in to finish it off. So that one is very, very skewed and I've not been 100% accurate, but it's not bad. It would be better if I zoomed in. So let's do that to finish that off. Actually, that one isn't bad, is it? This needs to move in a little bit. There it is. So all you need to do, the, uh, it is worth zooming in to make sure that you're as close as you possibly can be, um, because it will make quite a difference. Like I'm, I'm even outside of the black edge there. So that wouldn't look right at um, high res. But it's very simple to go in and just finesse this literally just by moving those points. This, again, is one of these things that used to be incredibly difficult to do, incredibly time consuming or require Photoshop to use smart objects. But you can now use your perspective transform in here to do that. There we go. You are done. Again, I would put that behind the reflection by moving the reflection on top. If I toggle the reflection on and off, you can see there. It's actually moving in and out, isn't it? Which is not helpful. It does make a bit of a difference. So leave that turned on there. So let's go in and wrap up. Um, I need to go back into there. Right, so quick recap. I spent quite a bit of time talking about the interface because that is one of the things that has really changed. It's a single window interface designed exclusively for you to focus on your actual images. So the main area of the interface they focus on is the canvas and everything else, all of the tools hang off it. If you think about how Pixelmator used to work, you used to have your canvas area in a window like that and then ha not hanging off it, but floating all over the place. You had lots and lots um, 
of panels. And that used to drive me crazy because I would, who moved my cheese? I want my panels where I know they are. So when I start Pixelmator, I know exactly where I'm going. And there were so many panels and they were all over the place. I never quite mastered that, I'll be honest. But in Pixelmator Pro, everything is within that single window. But to help you focus on your individual images, you can toggle on and off. So if we look there, there's no layers. But if you need to work with your layers, you can toggle them on. So you can concentrate on your actual image and they disappear when you don't need them. If you're working with text, you can turn on the text and you can work with the text. If you're not, they, it will get out of your way. So interface, huge, huge change. As we said, there was the Apple Core ML framework, your metal framework. Uh, this is your machine learning framework. And this is what powers those automatic layer naming. Uh, you won't be able to see that diagram, but that diagram is actually really interesting. Um, it shows you how it works. It starts off with the middle with an entity and then it, it fans out from there. So, for instance, equipment, musical instruments or sports equipments or tools or weapons or electronic devices. And then within each category, it has things like. So if we take that sports equipment one, billiard table, helmets, balance beams, rackets, parachutes. So it works in a kind of cascade. And as you saw, it wasn't bad. I think the worst one was when it thought that... Um, cat thing was an owl or the dog was a polar bear but we let it off with that so that's how that actually works it's machine learning and it's the machine learning that also powers the horizon detection which we saw on several images which works very well the quick selection uh, same principle it's making a selection it's the machine learning aspects that powers it we also very briefly looked at iCloud and how that sits behind it and enables you to edit your images within other machines or other platforms, as long as you save your stuff to iCloud, which I demonstrated many years ago with Pixelmator. And um, at the time I said iCloud wasn't really there, but to be honest, at the moment it's behaving quite well. So it probably is worth doing that if you have the space. Last thing to think about is that the price is expected to rise. We don't have a date when that will happen. This $54.99 is a launch price, but they've not said for how long. What they have said is it will go up as they add features, which is a model that quite a few other businesses have uh, taken on board, like Riedel with PDF um, Expert. PDF Expert started off quite inexpensively at around £10, and I think now it's nearly 60 So it's gone up as they've added features, and that's the intention of Pixelmator, which was why I was desperate to buy it, despite the fact my machine didn't want to play ball with me. So if you are going to buy it, I would suggest that you buy it sooner rather than later to save money. Not saying that there won't ever be a special offer on it. Who knows? So training wise, you can always watch my stuff live. Keep an eye on the channel or you can subscribe for notifications. If you're watching after, you will find videos at youtube.com slash Elaine Giles. So I will say thank you for being with us. Another mammoth session, but well worth it, I think, in terms of demos so you can see what's going on and also learn ways that you can uh, work faster and work smarter. So I would love to hear from you with your comments, questions and queries. At any one of those, uh, you can find me on social media or my blog. For the moment, I am going to uh, head out into Q&A. I've got a couple of sessions coming up with quirky software. So do keep your eye on the channel. But until next time, I will say good night for now and I will see you next time.